When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Canva presents a true crime of design. In the office, Maya spots something unusual in the presentation. What's this? It was an off-brand font. Her co-worker explains. I added the font. I thought it was fun. It was not. Maya solved it with Canva. Open up Canva, one click, and the font is on brand. Easy. Stay on brand and solve font crimes at canva.com. The home for every brand. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Garage Court Justice nominee, the Captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are very happy to be featuring Shadows of Laughter, Tara Me Sue, White Oak by the fine folks down at one of our favorites, Tactical Brewing in Orlando. This is an imperial stout brewed with ladyfinger cookies, rum-soaked coffee beans, Madagascar vanilla beans, and aged in white oak. Incredible. Garage grade, five out of five bottle caps. And here's some big praise and high praise and cheers to our good friends right here. First up, cheers to Ava in Medina, Ohio. And a big we like your jib to Sophie in Birmingham. Here's an extra cold cheers to C. Winters in Pittsburgh. And a big cheers to Kelly in Indianapolis, Indiana. All right, Captain, here we go. We have a big, big thank you to send to Aaron in Little Rock, Arkansas. And last, but certainly not least, cheers to Crystal Campos, residing in beautiful parts unknown. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website and helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, well, we're going to thank you. Yeah, BWRUN Beer Run. For all of our old episodes, download the Stitcher app. They are free. And check out our bonus show called Off the Record. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Florida is the third most populous state in the U.S. Florida is known for its sandy beaches and over 1,000 miles of coastline. Our true crime story this week will take place almost entirely at a house and property located at the end of Ghost Creek in North Hudson, Florida. If you're looking to catch some Spanish mackerel or sea trout, then you've come to the right fishing hole. With a name like Ghost Creek, 
Who knows what else is lurking at night? Early in the morning of Thursday, August 28, 2014, the Department of Emergency Services for Pasco County, Florida, received and recorded a conversation about a violent incident taking place just minutes before the call. 27-year-old Megan Brown was on the phone with Dustin Brooks, the 911 operator on duty, when the call came in. Megan can be heard crying, breathing heavily and moaning. Fighting through the tears, Megan said that her ex-boyfriend and the father of her only child attacked and threatened her. She said she was out late with some friends. And when she came home, 28-year-old Adam Matos held a kitchen knife to her throat and told her several times that his intentions were to kill her. But she had fought him off, and Adam had left. A deputy from the sheriff's office was dispatched to the scene. He arrived at 7719 Hatteras Drive shortly after the call. There, the officer spoke with Megan Brown and observed her to be very hysterical. She was crying, and it was obvious to the officer that she had been doing a lot of crying. The officer observed a substantial cut to Megan's left thumb. She explained she received the cut when trying to get the knife away from her throat and out of the hands of one very angry Adam Matos. The deputy collected the knife used in the attack. He took photographs of Megan, specifically her injury, and the immediate area where the incident took place. He observed and spoke with Megan, her mother, Margaret Brown, and Megan's four-year-old son, Tristan. The deputy attempted to locate the alleged assailant, Adam Matos, but he was unsuccessful. About two and a half hours later, the deputy returned to the house on Hatteras Drive. It is now just after 9 a.m. The deputy is responding to the residence after a call was placed by a man named Nicholas Leonard. Nicholas reported that an assault involving a knife was in progress at the house. Upon arrival, the deputy once again made contact with Megan Brown. Megan explained to the officer that this was simply a misunderstanding. Megan reported to Nicholas about the earlier attack via text. Nicholas thought the attack was in progress and called 911. Six days later, the officers returned to the same house. What they found there would be described by the media as the house of horrors. This is True Crime Garage. You just heard there in the trailer that this case is going to take us down to the Sunshine State. But first, we will start this week's true crime story in New Jersey, where Greg Brown married his girlfriend, Margaret, who was known to her friends and family as Maggie back in 1983. Greg was an electrician who co-ran and operated Brown Electric in Neptune, New Jersey. Maggie was outgoing, a social butterfly, who worked as an emergency medical technician. In 1987, Maggie gave birth to the married couple's youngest child, Megan Elizabeth Brown. The Brown family moved from their home in Brick, New Jersey, to Pennsylvania in 1998, where Greg and Maggie opened Hidden Hills Farm in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, where they bred and boarded dogs and horses. Megan graduated from Northwestern Lehigh High School in 2005, where she ran track and competed in the PA State Finals. She was a bit of a track star in high school, winning a silver medal in the triple jump at the 2005 PIAA Track and Field Championship. She earned an athletic scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania, where she attended. While at college, Megan started dating a guy named Adam Matos. Of course, this was college, so not supposed to be something serious, and it never really was. 
But Megan got pregnant. This was unplanned, but she was excited to be a mother. And she had the full support of her parents. And Megan's son, Tristan, was born in 2009. And Megan had committed all of her efforts to raising Tristan. This included reuniting with Adam Matos, the child's father. While still in Pennsylvania, it sounds like Adam was in and out of the Brown home. Just before 2014, Greg Brown had back surgery and decided to retire. The family plan was to move to Florida, and Maggie and Greg planned to build their tropical island dream home. Leading up to the move, Greg, a hardworking man all of his life, was unable to help with the moving process as he was still recovering from his recent back surgery. On July 2nd, 2014, the Browns, this included Greg, Maggie, their daughter Megan, and her only child, four-year-old son, Tristan, they move from their home in Pennsylvania down to Florida. The Browns are making this big move for many reasons, but the two bigger reasons seem to be that they have a family in the area, this also in step with retirement plans for Greg and Maggie. But this move will include Adam Matos, Tristan's father. This move looks like a life goal for the Browns, and everything that I have found says that Megan, while a super awesome and dedicated mother, the living arrangement of her and her son Tristan staying and living at mom and dad's house back in Pennsylvania was probably, yes, something that she desired to stay close to mom and dad, but also a living situation in a desirable home on a beautiful property, but probably captain a necessity. Megan is a young mother and of course children are not cheap. And so it was probably an ideal situation for Megan. Well, and also her son has special needs. He's autistic. So having the extra help probably was a necessity. And her parents, Greg and Maggie are super great people, great in giving parents and grandparents. They say, look, we're moving, but we want our daughter and grandson to remain close to us both in heart and proximity, so the two of you come and live with us as well. Well, like I said, this plan is going to include Adam Matos, ex-boyfriend to Megan and little Tristan's father. So the Browns move to Florida to be closer to extended family. And they are nice enough and thoughtful enough to allow Adam Matos to move with them to remain close to his son that he had with Megan Brown. Adam was going to be able to live with the Browns temporarily, yeah. you know, for a couple of months so that he can get set up in this new city, get a job, get settled in, and then find a place of his own to live. Right. It was agreed that he would live with them, he would also work, and he would chip in on the rent. The Browns would be renting a very nice house for the meantime while building what sounds to be their dream home. The Browns family, extended relatives living in Florida, help Greg, Margaret, Megan, and Adam move into their rented home and get settled in. The house that they are renting is large enough that Megan and Adam are able to have separate bedrooms. Shortly after moving to Hudson, Florida, Megan gets a job bartending at the Fisherman's Shack. This is a local pub. I'm guessing this is a dive bar. There's no website and zero Yelp reviews, but this could be the perfect little setup for Megan. The bar is less than a two-minute drive from the house her parents are renting, right. so it's always good to be close to work. And it's one of those cool little spots that's right along the water that is it's off of cow Creek, but it appears that you could pull your boat up and dock it somewhere in the back. Not long after this, as promised, Adam gets a job at the get hooked bar and grill. This looks like a cool place featuring live music, two bars and a large fresh seafood menu. Adam will be running the dish tank. Now at Megan's work at the fisherman's shack, she is quick to make friends. This will include both fellow employees and some of the regulars that come in. These are people that she will enjoy seeing at work and going out in groups after work and on her days off. One of these new friends is a young man named Nicholas Leonard. Nick is from Florida. He's a few years older than Megan, 
and he works as a carpenter and landscaper. It sounds like these two really hit it off. Well, to put some context there, Adam, when she met Adam, he was like a obscure DJ or something and wasn't much of a go-getter, wasn't known to be that hard of a worker. Right, right. Back at the rental house on Hatteras Drive, things are not going particularly well. Megan and Adam are not getting along, and there is quite the, this is quite the understatement, actually, but Adam does not appear to be getting along with Megan's family either. And it sounds like he was wearing out his welcome. At some point, Adam gets fired from his dishwashing job, and it looks like this only created further distance between Megan and Adam, and with a big part of the deal being Adam should be working and pitching in, this is going to create additional conflict between Adam and Megan's parents. Well, and I heard he was a horrible roommate. He wasn't taking out the trash. He wasn't cleaning up after himself. And I'm not really certain, 100% certain of what the deal was here, as this just sounds to me like a recipe for disaster. But I'm sure this likely started off with everyone, or at least Greg and Maggie, having the best of hopes and intentions for all involved. All right, here is where the high hopes that Greg and Maggie had for all on this new living situation starts to go off the rails. On Thursday, August 14th, 2014, Megan calls the local police to report that she's being threatened and harassed by a female. Police listen to her complaint, but decide this does not warrant any further action because Megan failed to provide hard details about the threats and harassment. Right. Police, of course, advised her how to best handle the situation should it occur in the future. Part of the issue may have been not only providing evidence of the harassment and threats, but Megan either didn't know who was harassing her or could not show evidence of who was harassing her. Right. So the identity of the alleged harasser was never determined by police. But it's a female, not a male. That's what her complaint was. Right. But we will quickly have an idea of who this alleged female harasser was. Because just about two weeks later, on Wednesday, August 27th, Nick Leonard, new friend in all the circle of friends agree to be dating Megan by this point in our timeline, He makes a somewhat anonymous call to a Verizon store in the greater Wichita, Kansas area. This was to call in a formal complaint about one of the Verizon employees. Her name is Michelle Stinson. Turns out that Michelle was a one-time girlfriend of Nick Leonard's. Michelle went out to Florida looking for Nick, and things are going to get ugly when she finds Nick's truck parked at Megan's house. Which is kind of confusing in this story because as far as Adam and Megan's relationship is concerned, it's never really clear. Are they an item when he when they moved to Florida? Were they on again, off again when they're in Florida? Because he tells so many lies, he being Adam, that he claims that they were together the whole time. Right, and I think what makes it very convoluted to any outsiders is you have a situation where at the end of the day, they're living together. Right. So it gets hard to determine what their boundaries are if they in fact even set any up. So this woman, she says that at some point she's down in Florida. This is Michelle. She went to Florida looking for Nick Leonard and she gets upset when she finds Nick's truck parked at Megan's house. She then spent some time, watching Nick from afar while he's spending a decent amount of time hanging out after work at the old fisherman's shack. So this complaint to Verizon from Nick Leonard is this woman, Michelle, a former romantic interest who lived in Wichita and who worked for Verizon was using her Verizon employee powers. Those are some amazing powers that you get Mm. over there to hack into his accounts. Similar to Spider-Man. Right. Mm -hmm. Shooting webs, um, and in addition to that, probably levitation homes. Yes. (laughs) Uh, 
So she's using these powers, or so he believes, to hack into his accounts. In Nick's words, he says she was stalking, harassing, and threatening him through the cell phone. And this isn't the first time, though. Correct. It's not really hard to piece together that this was likely the same person harassing Megan as well. Are you threatening me? His complaint to Verizon was that Michelle was using Verizon technology to hack into his phone. This meant his email account and his bank account as well. So you could use this info to then lead you to Megan's information. You see what his texts are. You see what his emails are, who he's communicating with. And then boom, you have her information. If you want to go out of your way to harass her as well. Nick went on to state that she allegedly went so far, she being the harasser, went so far as to not only harass and threaten Megan, but she contacted several of his business customers. It looks like Nick owned and operated his own business as a carpenter and landscaper or may have been getting jobs on the side somewhere, but she contacts these business contacts of his, his customers, and starts harassing them and telling them do not do business with Nick Leonard. On the same day, Nick reports this to local authorities in Florida as well. But he includes in this complaint that two others had been harassing him as well. In fact, at times he says they were even sitting outside of his home in a parked car. He describes these individuals as two heavier set Asian males. This is weird. We've all heard of an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend harassing a person. Yeah. An ex, an ex-lover or ex-friend. Lover, lover. We hear that all the time. But then to take it to the point of where he says, I think she's sending thugs over to threaten me as well. Mm -hmm. These guys just seem to be following me around and they're sitting outside my home. This is a whole nother level of of threat and harassment. Well, and at some point you go, is he just delusional and thinks people were following him? But when you have the evidence that yes, his ex is definitely stalking him, then you go, well, maybe all his claims are true. So on Wednesday, August 27th, Nick Leonard made an appointment with detective Kraus of the Pasco County Sheriff's office for the next day. The appointment was scheduled for August 28th, at 2 p.m. and the topic of discussion to file a formal complaint of harassment from his ex-girlfriend in Wichita. Later that same day, on the 27th, Megan Brown reports to work at the Fisherman's Shack. After work, Megan and co-worker Tanya Carlson go out after work. It sounds like they were meeting up with some others as this is always reported as a group thing. And I don't think it's important who most of the persons out together that night were, but one of the people in the group that night is reported to be Nick Leonard. Now it's after midnight. So technically it's now Thursday, August 28th, 2014 in our timeline. Megan is still out with her friends with this group of friends. She's at a bar having a good time or at least trying to, because this is obviously going to be upsetting to Adam. And we will know this because Adam in the early morning hours of the 28th, well, he starts to try to reach out and get in touch with Megan. And this quickly leads to a series of repeated calls and text to Megan harassing her. Yeah. This guy has no control. I mean, once he starts trying to contact her, and this happens several times in their relationships. We're talking about hundreds of calls and hundreds of texts within a short period of time. Which is so bizarre when you think about it because everyone really describes him, and I think this is absolutely spot on. I've seen tons of interviews with this guy, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely correct in their description of him as a quiet guy who doesn't talk a lot. But as you're pointing out, he decides... I don't like what's going on, flips a switch, and he won't shut up. He won't leave Megan alone. As said, 
To put it politely, this leads to a series of repeated calls and texts to Megan harassing her. He wants to know where she is, what she's doing, and who she might be out with. He repeatedly tells her during these calls and on text that she is a horrible mother. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right. Cheers, mates. Cheers to everybody having a cocktail with the captain and colonel. And if you're not having a cocktail, just make sure you jiggle your booty a little bit. And don't forget that next week is election day. So get out there and vote. Make arrangements because you can vote in advance if Tuesday is no good for you. Remember what they used to say when we were kids, Captain? Get out there and rock the vote. Rock the vote. Sometime after 5 a.m., but before 5.30 a.m., Megan Brown returned home after a night out with friends. At 6.07 a.m. is when a call to 911 comes in. This will be the first of two 911 calls, both placed by Megan. This call got disconnected, and I could not find out the reason why. It does not appear that this was discussed in the second call. It could be for any number of reasons, obviously. Someone hung up the phone, the phone simply dropped the call, any number of reasons. The operator tried to call back several times, but got no answer, got Megan's voicemail. This is protocol for this 911 center. Call drops, you can't speak with the caller, you try calling them back. Then at 6.11 a.m., the second call from Megan's phone came in to 911 emergency services. This is the call that we spoke of in the trailer today. During this 11-minute call, Megan is very upset and heard to be crying hysterically. On the call, she is bouncing back and forth between telling the operator what has happened, you know, reporting the attack, and she is also reporting any additional things that are going on during the phone call itself. She says, I came home and my son's dad pushed me against a wall, put a knife to my throat, and he threatened to kill me. And he cut my hand and I'm bleeding everywhere and my son is freaking out. Please have someone come out here as soon as possible. Megan says she managed to get the knife from Adam Matos and says that Adam took off and he fled from the house around the time that their son woke up. 
she can be heard saying the knife is in my son's room and I'm trying to get him, meaning Tristan, her son, out of the room and she's going to put the knife in the kitchen. She says she can't look at the knife because it's covered with blood, with a lot of blood. Right. She's explaining that her thumb is cut, it hurts really bad, and she can see everything. I think that she means that she can see everything past the skin through the cut in her thumb. Yeah, there's no picture that I found online of this injury. Anyone that's ever injured themselves or, or, or suffered a cut especially a deep one and you yeah. look at it, it's shocking when you, ugh. Yeah. And I, I'm laughing in a, in a, not in a funny way. It's more out of a nervous way. Yeah, nervous way. She tells the operator that she got her son and she locked herself and her son inside her bedroom. She said that Adam took off down the street, but he was turning around. I was really trying to determine if Adam was driving a car or if he was, riding a bike. And I think that there's evidence later that will suggest that he is riding a bike. She's never descriptive enough to say that he's driving a car, but using the words turning around would imply that they're driving or operating something. They're not just, I don't think most people say that when someone's just walking or running down the the street, she tells the operator, and this is, this is pretty freaky right here that he is now out front of the house. He's back on the property. He's at the front door. He's knocking on the door. Megan says that she has called the police. She tells Adam, look, I'm, I'm on the phone with 911. So Adam takes off again. At some point in the call, she says, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. I'm so scared. If I knew he was going to do that, I wouldn't even have went out. Well, and this shows you what kind of person she was and what kind of mother she was because she's putting the blame on herself for something she's not responsible for. This shouldn't have happened just because you went out after work to hang out with a couple people. Right, because this is not even, it's not just a problem for her. It's also creating a lot of drama and unnecessary problems for mom and dad because we're living at mom and dad's house and my son. Yeah, well, I mean, this is showing how Adam is a dick-nosed meat log. But I think it also shows, it gives us a little insight into what the truth might be about their relationship and their living situation. She may just have thought that Adam was simply there at the house to help with Tristan, to take care of his son, and to get set up in a new city and not have to live hundreds of miles away from his son. Right. And that he should just grow up and be an adult while she goes out with some friends after she worked at her job all day. Makes yeah. sense to me, but Hey, I'm just, but he's very immature. I'm just some dude drinking a beer in a garage. What do you know? What the hell do I know about it? You anything? don't have superpowers. What I do know is that as said in the trailer, the mm. deputies arrived quickly on the scene. By this point though, it appears that Adam Matos is, as they say, long gone. Yeah. Police investigate at the scene and look for Matos for somewhere between an hour and approximately up to an hour and a half. I want to underline that real quick before we move on. They say that they investigate, they look for Matos for more than an hour and approximately up to an hour and a half. You have to wonder though, was Adam somehow able to hide and conceal himself tucked away somewhere nearby. Well, this house was also on the water, right? It's on the water. It's, it's a canal that comes off of that ghost Creek. And if you look it up on a map, it's a neat little neighborhood. It, it has several streets and, and a lot of the houses have these canals that go near the houses. I mean, for all we know, he's just hiding in some bush somewhere. A real sack sniffer. Well, that's what I mean. And the I say this because I find it very interesting, the sequence of events when you start plugging in all of the detailed timed information that we have and right. filling in the blanks along the way, right? Let's, let's go through this, shall we? 
We know the call that the deputy responded to came in at 6, 11 a.m. We know per the police report that the deputy was on the scene within minutes of the call. The call lasted approximately 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. So about 622, the 911 call ends. Then the officer is on the scene. So let's say on the scene as early as 623 to 625. Then per the report, the police investigated. This is asking questions, observing, taking notes, photographs, documenting the incident, and searching for the alleged perpetrator of the assault, which is Adam Matos. All of this, per the report, took more than an hour and approximately up to an hour and a half. So now we are, we're talking about a time frame. We're anywhere as early as 7.23 a.m. up to about 7.55 a.m. I find this type of minutia very fascinating because per the records, at 7.49 a.m., starting at this time, Adam Matos starts making another one of his now famous move of repeatedly calling over and over again to Megan's phone. And so that's what I wondered was, yes, they looked for this guy, but he had to have been somewhere close nearby because his calls to Megan start almost exactly at the same time that the police leave the area. Right. And again, not a call or 10 calls. We're talking like over a hundred calls. Right. It's an Adam Matos. I'm going to call or text you dozens of times in a very short period of time. It's insane. Look, she's not answering his calls because she knows what she's going to get. Should she pick up the phone? He's sending her nasty and threatening text to go along with these unanswered calls. Well, I, I know most of the people that are listening know this, but just in case you need to hear this, this kind of contact, constantly calling, constantly texting, talking trash, harassment through text, this is a type of abuse. This is a type of control. And this, if this is helping, if this is happening to you, please reach out to your family and friends. I also think the one making the calls in the text, that the, it's some kind of psychosis on their end as well. Yeah. Some, there might even be a term for that somewhere, some, somewhere out there under <laughs> the stars above. Out there. <laughs> Beneath the pale blue. I don't know. The, right. I can't remember the words. Well, All right. So this, now this part is very upsetting to me. This is where I want to get the old, set the beer down, get up, punch the guy right in the face. Not as upsetting as you not knowing those lyrics. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, but this warrants a punch to the face. Okay. In the face. When Megan is not answering her phone. Adam is nice enough to start calling Maggie's phone, Megan's mother. Right. Oh, I'll just start calling her and ruin her day now right. because Megan's not answering her phone. That's how much of a child I am. Right. But the, like you said, maybe some sort of psychosis. Right. It's you can't it, control it at this point. Maybe. It's like a child, though, when you're not getting the response that you want, which is as simple as someone on the other end picking up the phone. You just keep trying and trying and calling and calling again. Yeah. Over 100 calls were made from Adam Matos to Megan and Maggie. And these all started at 749 a.m. Almost like he sat there somewhere watching and waiting for the police to leave and then started right back in on the threats immediately after the police departure from the house on Hatteras Drive. As if that is not the most annoying thing ever. All of those calls over and over. It turns out that the night before when Megan was out with friends, mm -hmm. Adam made over 100 calls to Megan while she's out trying to have a good time after work around 8 30 AM. Megan calls her friend, Tanya Carlson. This is her coworker that she was out with the night before Megan tells Tanya, that Adam has attacked her and that she has never seen him act this way before. And that she was concerned that Adam might attack her again and maybe even kill her, follow through on the threats that he was making. 
Megan says she will be unable to go to work that day. She says that she is afraid that Adam will show up at the house when she is at work and take their son, take Tristan, and never return again. Just after 9 a.m., Nick Leonard calls 911 to report that Megan Brown was being attacked. A deputy again responds, thinking that Adam must have returned to the house and that this was a new attack. Let's go through this slowly because this part is a little confusing. Well, to put it very simply, it wasn't a new attack. It was a misunderstanding. Right. While the attack went down just after or right around 6 a.m., this is new information at this time, around 9 a.m., to Nick Leonard. Right. He is simply reporting the earlier attack to the police to which law enforcement has already responded. It's We all live this. We all kind of know, not this exact situation, but he has communicated this information via text from Megan. So it's... It's one of those situations where text, there's no tone of voice. There's no way to really fully comprehend what's understood or going on rather than reading the text itself. So he misunderstands. He's like, oh, crap, there's a she's being attacked. She says there's a knife involved. I better call 911. Right. The police show up. We were talking about this off mic earlier today. The police unfortunately a lot of what they deal with are these domestic disputes a lot of adults behaving like children scumbags yeah a lot of a lot of spats let's call them um and poop canoes what we have here the police of course they're like well duh this makes sense it's it's a couple hours later of, of course he he came back so they rush out there and this time they find luckily he's not there he has not returned he's not done any further damage Okay, we'll go back out and we'll look for him again. But again, this time, they still don't find him. No, and this will be the last call that deputies will respond to on August 28th, 2014 at the Brown house that they're renting on Hatteras Drive. Just after noon, so 12 p.m. noon, just after that time, This is an approximate time. Greg Brown, Megan's father, is at a store where he purchases a spark plug and spark plug tool using a credit card belonging either to him or to his wife, Maggie. That afternoon, the Brown's neighbor, Ryan McCann, says Greg is setting up a table and chairs on his back porch. Greg telling the neighbor that Megan would be having a party at some point with her friends after work. Around 2.30 p.m., Detective Kraus calls and speaks with Nick Leonard via telephone about Nick missing their scheduled appointment. So we kind of have to go back to one event earlier in our story here, Captain, where, remember, Nick was getting harassed by a female, He believed it to be an ex-girlfriend of his, and he phoned it in to the local police there in Florida, even though he believed his harasser was in Wichita, and he discussed with Detective Kraus about coming in and filing a formal written complaint about what was going on, uh, being hacked, his phone being hacked, his accounts being hacked, so on and so forth. On the 27th of August, he made this appointment with Detective Kraus for 2 p.m. on the 28th. Detective Kraus is calling Nick Leonard because it's now 2.30 and Nick Leonard has never shown up to this appointment. Nick tells Detective Kraus that something has come up and that he is busy and what he's going to do is he's going to call the detective back next week so that they can reschedule this appointment. At 3 p.m., Maggie Brown arrives for and begins her scheduled work shift at a local convenience store. Shortly after 3 p.m., Megan Brown fails to report to work. She calls her boss at 3.09 p.m., and she tells him that she was scared 
and tells him that she and her son are in danger and she would not be able to come in for her shift that day at work. At 4.12 p.m., Adam Matos calls Megan Brown again. Per reports, this would be the last call, even after the hysterics of calling over 100 times earlier that day. Right. This is the last call from Adam's phone to Megan's phone per the report uh, that we were we were able to see. Sometime after 6 p.m., we don't have an exact time for this, but sometime after or around 6 p.m., again, this comes from the neighbor, Ryan McCann. He says that around that time, he loans Greg Brown a ratchet. Greg says he needs the ratchet to work on a spark plug in his RV's generator or on his RV's generator. Right. This makes sense because we know from his credit card statements that earlier that day he was at a hardware store. He's out purchasing a spark plug. Maggie Brown's shift is over at 11 p.m. And at 11, 10 p.m., she leaves work at the convenience store and heads home. From door to door, this is a drive time of approximately 15 minutes. So she is arriving at the rental house around 11.25 p.m. Sometime between 11.45 p.m. and midnight, a neighbor in this neighborhood is out for a walk, and he says that he hears what he believed to be gunshots. He says he thought that he heard three gunshots sometime between 11.45 p.m. and midnight. Continuing on with our timeline, this brings us to Friday. Yes, this would be Friday, August 29th, 2014. Around 3 p.m., Megan Brown does not show up for her work shift. Also at this exact same time at 3 p.m., her mother, Maggie Brown, fails to report to work. They work at different locations, so this is a kind of a way to double check that one and both are not accounted for. Right. Let's go to September 4th, 2014 at 9 54 AM. Linda Thomas. This is Megan's grandmother. She calls the Pasco County Sheriff's office to request a welfare check on the Brown family saying she hasn't heard from the Brown family, specifically Megan, since August 28th. Police respond to the Brown family home and discover what appears to be the obvious signs of a very bloody and violent attack. So the way this works, Captain, is that it has been six days yeah, since anyone time. has heard from the, the Brown family. Yeah. And when cops show up, you know, they knock on the door. Nobody appears to be home at the Brown's house. They say while they're there, they detect a foul odor, and these are seasoned cops. They've been on the job for a while. They say it's the all-too-familiar odor of death and decaying bodies. Yeah. These Horrible. guys know, these guys and girls of blue know that they're not responding to something good. This is a bad situation. And you can smell that kind of smell from rooms away. They find a door that was left open. So they have probable cause to enter the home. They entered the house through this open door. And this door was one that would lead right into the garage where the family, where the Brown family's van is parked. Mm -hmm. This next bit is from the daily mail, which did gangbusters work on this case. Quote, they, being law enforcement, immediately see blankets on the ground behind the van in the garage. There is what appears to be blood all over the floor and on these blankets. But also on the bumper. Yes. And about the same time, a veteran cop makes another grim discovery. This, just a stone's throw away from the home. He says that after noticing the same smell of death coming from a wooded area... He goes in to take a look there. The detectives find something worse than they have ever seen in all of their years in law enforcement. It was a pile of bodies. 
Sheriff's Office Detective Chet Kugel said to the Daily Mail, quote, they were decomposed beyond recognition. We didn't know exactly who or how many total bodies were in the pile. But Detective Kugel said he could easily deduce that the Brown family was among them. Quote, it was just common sense. You know, we had a house with several people that are missing, and now we have a pile of bodies less than a mile away. At 2 p.m., a forensics team arrives with the medical examiner at the site where the bodies were dumped. As the medical examiner tries to identify the victims, detectives and forensic experts go back to the house Mm -hmm. and of course they find they're returning to a shocking scene the place turns pink when it's sprayed with luminol there's a trail of blood stretching throughout the house signs that the killer had tried to clean up some of it and other clues to the horror that had occurred there some really good evidence is found in this van officers said Quote, we knew there were people, dead people and decaying people in the back of that van at some point. There was a significant amount of blood in the van. They found blood and they found maggots in the van as well. And there's pictures of that online as well. And it's very jarring to see that because you know that when they opened up this vehicle, probably the smell got more intense, but to see those maggots in that car like that. um, Just horrible. And it's somewhat of a trite description, the house of whores, but you know, given by the newspapers and the media at the time, but that's what it is. That's the best way to explain what these officers walked into. A lot of blood. And then like you said, with the luminol, it just lit up the whole house. And then the smell of death and decay is so strong that it leads these officers from the house to a half to a three quarter miles away out into a wooded area where they find this pile of bodies. Right. Back in the garage, back in the van, they also found a shovel in the back of the van. The detectives believe that the killer had used the shovel to try to bury the bodies in the yard saying that on the side of the house, there was a freshly dug area. But in that area, you can't dig more than a foot. Someone tried to bury these bodies on the side of the house and simply gave up. Yeah, because doesn't it turn to stone when you're you're in Florida? Isn't it like they're a bunch of lime rock or something? Clay, stone, lime rock, yes, it gets difficult. Investigators found evidence to support the theory that the murderer tried to load the bodies into the back of the van, was successful in doing so, and then dumped them in that wooded area. Thanks for joining us here in the garage for everything True Crime Garage. Check out the website truecrimegarage.com join us back here tomorrow and until then be good be kind and don't litter You can live out your MasterChef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.